Well, hello everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Yes, St. Valentine. The legend says that St. Valentine restored the sight to the blind daughter of his jailer, uh, later suffering martyrdom. And so uh, this world can be challenging indeed. And uh, I'm here, uh, Joe Visconti will be joining me shortly. And uh, my name is John Barnwell. And I'm north of Detroit, Detroit, the Straits. And I thought we'd have a conversation today regarding Rudolf Steiner and the Grail language. When you enter into that, one can quickly surmise that that's a very deep subject, being that Rudolf Steiner once, or on more than one occasion, actually referred to what he was giving the world as the grail mysteries, basically. And so you enter into that and you say, well, what is that, you know, that, uh, I mean, I remember these stories from when I was a child about this bumpkin, this fool that was shielded by his mother from the ways of the world because her husband was a knight who went off on an adventure and never returned. And so this bumpkin, Parseval, was the son of the widow. And being that he was the son of the widow, he was very naive as to the worldly ways of things. And he had taken his motivations from being in nature, the, all the forces of nature surrounding him and all the animals, and the wind. And so when you get into that kind of an image and you carry it further into the tradition in the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, at the very beginning of the story, he has to decide to pass, but there was a flight of crows that uh, showed up and that distracted him and, and he ended up selecting his path. And so this happenstance event, so to speak, was a guiding impulse for him. And I guess since Joe's not here yet, oh, here he is. Joe Viscati. I gave you two minutes to warm me up. <laughs> I was just talking about the bird language. Okay. The language of the birds. The right. grail language. And, and how Christian Rosenkreutz due to the uh, intervention of a flight of birds, chose the path that he chose in the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. And so if you read the chemical wedding or a later version of uh, an initiatic fairy tale, the fairy tale of the green snake and the beautiful lily by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, and who was contemporary with Beethoven and Mozart, and Novalis, this whole cast of individuals that, that changed the world. I mean, Haydn, I mean, what about him? Think about it. Most people, they don't know anything about him, but yet he transformed the way in which symphonic music was developed and structured. And, it's the, marvelous, was uh, but during... I'm sorry, but here we are. I, I could go on and on. I was going to tell a story, but I'll tell it later. But we're here with Joe Visconti, the president of the American Shakespeare Company and a Emmy Award winning videographer and lifelong anthroposophist. So I'll let him take a sip and well, Say hello. I was, 
Thank you for the intro. Yeah, um, the uh, I've been doing a little study for this one here today. You know how this is. Uh, I'm, I'm reading, uh, working on my book. is 20 years old. Michael Chekhov on the technique of acting. And this book was put out with so much of Rudolf Steiner in it. I brought, browsed through it again the last couple of days, looking at some quotes. And I want to start with this one here. Uh, it's on incorporation and characterization, chapter six. Um, players, which are actors. Players are the only honest hypocrites. Hamlet. Um, and <laughs> But during this time of, of Shakespeare and the composers you're speaking about and the artists, uh, it was a time of great spiritual, um, pro I won't say products, but they were products being given during the age of Gabriel uh, to mankind when we, I think we talked about this last week on the development of the frontal lobe during the Gabriel time. And so it was a time when they, where the arts were actually uh, able to be given to man and the intellectualization that occurred later on under uh, Michael, 1879, be begins the content of spiritual activity, but it really is the art. And so Chekhov and, and Stanislavski uh, taking the art forms are, are more than acting. And that's what I really want to talk about today. Why the world loves acting. Children love to pretend. What is it about all of this that um, um, even playing music, trying to interpret your your, your whole organism is, is playing or violin, you are performing. And uh, Chekhov does a great job here in Chapter 6 and uh uh, uh, incorporation. It's the chapter. Something that is really, uh, it struck me differently. I, I don't know, pull it out and push it right at you here. Um, and he talks about everything is the imagination. And again, Rudolf Steiner's all imagination. So Chekhov in his book goes through a variety of, uh, of uh, topics that he creates, uh, which he created it in the Matt, uh, Moscow Art Theater with Stanislavski and how how they developed intuitively. There was no like masters they were reading. They discovered this by by acting and working and running into all the cliches and realizing that cliches were just going to be you know, worn out during a production. And so he, des he decides to um, check off through Rudolf Steiner to adopt the imagination. And so he takes, I'll just paraphrase some of the stuff. He takes the imagination, and if you have a character you're going to play in a movie or a theatrical performance, and as you're trying to get into the character, your body will reject it. You really won't let the character in. And from the size of your body and your limbs to your height to all these different things, the imagination body that you create and you visualize and you imagine this character doing these things. And as you do that, then um, you look in the outer world also at people. Uh, he's, again, he quotes Rudolf Steiner here in chapter six. I know Steiner speaks about people. Watch them, observe them like a good scientist would, and take the observations of people in action under many circumstances. Then take your imagination, do your own work, and let it all sink into your unconscious. And then when you need it, it you will re-identify it with yourself and bring it up like the lady of the lake with the sword and you'll be able to slowly grab a hold of the imagination, what it's doing and showing and the physical body will start to follow little by little piece by piece, arm by arm and arm. And the more you rehearse and perform the imagination um, will, will take over. I've done this in acting before. Uh, and after five, six, seven, eight performances, uh, you start to feel you're really getting into the role or is the role getting into you? <laughs> um, and but, but this can translate to everything in life. I was watching my girlfriend this morning. She was doing, she's gorgeous. She's doing her beauty in the mirror, you know, the makeup mirror with the big bulbs. And I said to her, I said, I need to talk to you about something later. You transfer. She's unique. She can transform herself just for beauty. But I said, today you used a darker eyeshadow. And as I watched her look in the mirror from behind her, she was becoming. And all women who do makeup know that. They put the makeup on or whatever. And all of a sudden they start to become. And so this becoming, this transcendental uh, trans transitioning your human form starts with the imagination. 
And so, but you can also do it looking in the mirror and start to ch change the way you see yourself. And this is what Chekhov is speaking about, how how to consciously, uh, becoming human, becoming a cool human, um, that you become, and it's, it's magic. It really is magic. It's the magic that the kids believe in, Magic Kingdom from Disney. It's magical. And we lose this as we get older and we get Bits and pieces maybe we hang on to try to, you know, and the TV gives us commercials and we see ourselves in that Range Rover with the ad and our house and the stereotypes. And we, we try to go get money to fit into that role that the world and Madison Avenue created. But but you could do this with anything. And people do this with anything all day long. They really get into it. So their talent or experience from whatever industry or trade or career they're in, they know they get better at it. What they don't realize is they're, they've been acting all along, utilizing the will forces, which we sleep in. But as we do more and more, the will becomes more stronger and I'll be quiet for a second let you jump in over here <laughs> but anyway it was really it's really neat that acting in theater is part of our life since birth and we use it all the time most of the times we just don't even pay attention to what we're really doing yes acting well you go back to william shakespeare and the tempest act one scene two and you have the the spirit of the air ariel and she says, hell is empty and all the devils are here. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, perhaps even more profound than, than one might realize if, if you're looking at nature as a, a symphony of being seen and unseen. And being that Ariel is a spirit of the air, I was going to tell a little story that I've told before, but it's such a beautiful story. I used to live out on Pine Lake above the marina with a balcony overlooking the lake. And it was really a wonderful period in my 20s. But uh, I had this little BMW 2002 like rally car. And, and there's all these winding roads uh, going around the lakes. And I was on the way home and I was just kind of clipping along and I come up to this big turn by right next to uh, Pine Lake Country Club. And there's a little bird in the road and he's got a stick in yeah. his beak, a big, a big stick, you know, and he's, and he's just standing there looking at me defiantly and i'm coming in you know with a good amount of speed because it's a fun corner and he wouldn't move and so i slowed down and then he he took off and then i came around the turn and there was a a, a child maybe one years old or six months to one years old sitting in the road playing with a toy <laughs> so i got out of a got the kid out of the road and, and went on my way. But without that cue from Mother Nature, uh, that story could be very, very different. And so we're always being given cues. And this was the early training of Parsifal, this being in the woodlands and having nature surrounding him and taking his cue from, from nature's gifts so to speak. And so you get into the tradition itself and the alchemical tradition, and they talk about the alchemical language, the language of the birds, the long verts, the green language, that what is that green language of nature where, in, where you have like the book by Jakob Bima, the, the Rosicrucian uh, tradition author and his book, uh, regarding the signatur rerum. What is the signatur rerum? Well, it means the signature of all things and that there's this uh, imprint. Like you, if you go into the apocalypse, you see that the, he talks about the seven seals of the apocalypse. And Rudolf Steiner says it's, that should be taken much more literally than one 
would realize because when you get into understanding the the occultism behind the apocalypse and and the other uh, specifically the gospels that the, he he referred to the gospel writers as inspired occultists and so that's kind of a big cue and so when you get into that what does that mean and you start realizing that the tradition itself the esoteric christian tradition is conveyed in symbolism and figurations and drawn largely from nature but also in arts in music in theater and painting and he said that it is actually a, a higher manifestation to to make a painting of something uh, than to to theoretically discuss the tree, for example, and and, and that there's this well, th th that's this part. Lewis, let me give, oh, give oh. you the the final point. And he he had once said that that there's something that's called uh, creation out of nothing, and that the, all else is wrapped up in your karmic journey, and that to be able to to create from nothing. Uh, to have something happen that that has never happened before that way, and that that there's something very special about that, and that that's referred to in the East as Nirvana. And he says Nirvana is not the elimination of the ego; it's the equilibrium of the ego that gets one to the point to where one can take action above and beyond karma. And he gives the example of the life of Buddha or the incarnation of Christ, that those are free acts uh, through the process of creation out of nothing. Exactly. And, and, be, and what I was going to get at when I spoke earlier about the will forces, this is so important because we don't have access to the will consciously. As, as Rudolf Steiner states, we, we, uh, we're awake in our thinking, we dream in our feeling, and we are asleep in our will. And so we try to influence our will. Madison Avenue is trying to witness, uh, affect our will all the time. People throughout karma are trying to affect our will forces. There's so much of that effect going on. But the will, uh, and you know, people that are athletes will know this. Even people that do spontaneous work. I don't care what the trade or industry. If you have free flowing, uh, you kind of see that with Elon Musk, the way he's testing and trying not to promote him, but what he's doing with the company, trying to make it free or better, even though you're dealing with AI and technology, how can we make this interactive where human beings can get the most about it, but it's cre it's creative. And that's the key you mentioned with the creative beings, uh, which are connected to the archetypes, which means that everything we see is originated from archetypes. This is, this is the valley of the shadow of death. And so if we want to create here, as you're speaking about on this plane, then the conscious participation with these forces these powers uh with the creative beings we have to be like crystal clear like initiates to be able to not once we start influencing and touching it with egoism not ego egoism we start to move it out of balance to that pure creativity uh i like to do the steiner stuff i call it my whole life where it's applicable where you can actually I don't want to use the word utilize it for money, but you could utilize it for practical life versus theoretical information that floats out there. Um, I remember being in uh, college and I loved math, which I hated in, in high school because they were applying it to technology and electronic engineering. And I was like, oh, that's why we're doing that algebraic equation. That's what the calculus is for. It's applied. Uh, you're connected. And your will forces start to participate with the will forces of the cosmos. And so with Rudolf Steiner's information and insights that he brings down from the spiritual world, we are, as Chuck, I've said, we are, as anthroposophists, slowly incorporating in our being, in our body, this imaginative information, which is so important for us to, to meditate on and think about in different ways and and as we realize after years and years of study, it's alive. 
It's creative. And that is so scary in our time for people because they're looking to replicate and make something have one meaning and have it dead and uh, and not let it move. Uh, like this cup of coffee here, I'm going to sit over here. You can't see it. If you sit, it doesn't move. Well, that's not how life and, and intuition and creativity and imagination is. And so we're given a little time in our life to actually participate in free creative deeds. Um, and But but the, the key is, as you were speaking about the uh, lily and the green snake and the uh, chemical wedding, these are spiritual um, processes. And so we're constantly co-creating. I don't even think we're that much co-creating with what's happening to us. What's going to happen today, we think, for you or for me or anyone, we would think these are the choices. It's Valentine's Day. I've got to get roses. I have to do this. I have to do We go along with tasks and things we plan out. But how much of today is really being co-created by angels and other beings and elemental forces so much of the world is happening are we really free or are we in a role of our life and what choices do we have to exit stage and come back so rudolf steining really puts it into play uh, for Chekhov. Uh, which separates him from Stanislavski with the imagination because there's nothing we can't overcome. There's nothing we can't transcend without imagination because once we open up the imagination, it's like a prosecutor cross-examining and questioning. We open Pandora's box in a good way. The world, we ask it and we're wondering, come in. What do I do today? Ask the spiritual world to come in. And our daily task and everything we do, we do that anyway. We just don't know it. And what we're doing here, John, is we're talking about the that world that everybody is doing partially or a little bit, and yet they don't know it. And the more you can understand it, the more you can be free to realize just where you are. And uh, and so acting in theater and the will forces, um, we we really are striving for freedom and it's only going to come from the consciousness of where we are in this cosmology. Yes. I, it really, if you, if you look deeper into the, the uh, tradition itself and you look at the Gothic cathedrals, for example, Rudolf Steiner made the point, you know, that the, the, Cathedrals were meant to be actual artistic expressions of the message of Christianity. And he said the key to understand the function of the Gothic cathedrals is that they're meant to have people inside of them. And that that's the point. Whereas uh, if you go to like ancient Egyptian temples, that was to keep out the uninitiated, really. It was something that was very, very secret. But once that mystery had been taken to the light of day with, through the mystery of Golgotha, where the initiation became something that was becoming available for all mankind, then it became something that now that we've moved away from the dreamy uh, world of atavistic clairvoyance into the, the waking consciousness of the intellectual soul that began in 747 BC and extended until 1413, 1414 AD, that that level of soul is highly articulated as it was and you go to the writings of, of the Thomas Aquinas and all the various church writers and all of that, but yet they couldn't bring to expression spiritual science. That that realm had to first develop. And so you you get the, uh, what the central theme of, of the grail history is that there's a metamorphosis that happens, that, that times change, that we enter into different periods, cultural ages, archangelic periods. And so 
Rudolf Steiner gets into talking about the Archangel Gabriel and, and the great developments that happened in preparation for the age of Michael. And so you have this age of Gabriel bringing about the developments that came together in, in the cultural milieu and in the realm of, of intellectual science and, and these types of understandings. And, and like uh, Joe was referring to earlier, he actually worked into the structure of the convolutions of the frontal part of the brain to be able to receive the kind of insights that would arise during the age of Michael. And one way in which one can understand that, I saw uh, a Beethoven movie the other day. It was very interesting because it was a movie about him just putting on a production of uh, one of his pieces. And really the gist of the story, once you see it, is seeing the faces of the people as they're hearing this, this great work of Beethoven's for the first time. That it's actually like they're they're rewiring their <laughs> circuitry you know they're hearing things that have never been heard before because again he was able beethoven was able to to do that deed that creation from nothingness and that's that artistic realm and that's a central understanding to approach the works of rudolf steiner is that if you feel overwhelmed by the task of trying to master his works intellectually, don't forget that he was asked, uh, or he mentioned, uh, were he to do it again, he would have put more emphasis on, on the arts. And, but yet there's this like tremendous emphasis on the arts in Rudolf Steiner's work already with the architecture, with the theater and eurythmy and music and, and, uh, painting with leisure painting and watercolors and and putting on plays uh, Goethe's Faust Rudolf Steiner's mystery dramas and so how much more could he have done artistically and so you, you the point to get from that is that it's the arts and in fact in reference to the renaissance Rudolf Steiner had once said about the renaissance it was a time set aside for the spreading of Christianity through art. Yeah, and um, he gave so much, Rudolf Steiner gave so much that he didn't, I think, what that was not the arts, but for science. Because what he has left, which we study, which we look at in a hundred years, it will be a testament. Right now it's rejected uh, by the masses of technology and science, but it will be the bedrock in the future. Uh, so he gave so much more for the future. And when they look back, they'll say the answers are there, but nobody looked at it. Similar to the way uh, Rudolf Steiner speaks about Christ, Jesus Christ, a man uh, crucified in, in uh, Palestine when the world didn't even notice, but it did later. And so this will be noticed because it has to be given uh, the way it was, not, not in the dogma, um, but out of love. And, and, and that's the thing also I'd like to talk about. It's like fishing uh, with this new thinking, this kingdom. And this is why they use the fish and fishing all the time in the Gospels. If you go on fishing, you feel all of a sudden out of nowhere, out of the deep, you get a fish. Well, you may get an intuition. Oh, I have an idea. You're fishing out there for whatever you're doing in life. And then all of a sudden out of the unknown unconscious collective call of what you will but out of there without the brain processes of deducted reasoning and training that we've been done in school we've done a school we look step by step algebraic equation broken down uh or the format of uh, of a novel or a, uh, you know a uh, an essay the structure of an essay the components of an essay without that all of a sudden something comes in so it's what we built during the gabriel with the structure because they were this is where structure was coming from during the time of gabriel until 1879 the frontal lobe and structure all types of structure um now we're and michael were these i don't even want to call them intuitions these these truths about what we're thinking will come to us, but they're not coming through the brain activity of the structured form in education. And again, this is very scary because how can you 
quantify? How can you control it? There is no controlling the cosmos. There is no controlling it. And so what we look at in our time is that everything seeking control, power structures control. And yet for everyone, these answers in our daily life from the smallest tasks to, to the large challenges, if we open ourselves up, open up, open up the cosmos of our individuality, the spiritual world is waiting to deliver. All we have to do is ask. As Jesus says in uh, John 3, 14, three times he says it, ask and you will receive in my name, the Father. Ask, you have not asked. Ask that you will you you're, will be satisfied and happy. So over and over, Jesus is telling us, open up. And this isn't the gospel stuff. This is not this is Rudolf Steiner, but it's the same thing. Open up and ask. Really ask and be interested and want it and wanting to know. And it will be given. The knocking it will be received over and over. We're hearing this throughout our life. That is the process of this new heart. The, you know, this, the kingdom is descending of new thinking through the heart. And if the heart asks, and really it's the heart that has to ask. People may say, well, what does that mean? Well, the heart has to ask versus the head. When the head tries to think, it's doing this and it's pensive and it's trying to do this. But if the heart just opens up and says, hey. And sometimes it feels with the heart that it's not um, it's not suffering enough. It's not hard enough. The heart doesn't work that way. It just can ask a question simply. And yet the value and the power isn't there for us to feel that we're thinking hard enough and working hard enough. And it doesn't have to be that way in our time. We're moving past the time of having to be pensive all the time, using our intuition and allow the spiritual world at through Christ, to come in and work in our lives. This is what you're seeing throughout all your religions, your Christian religion. Let Jesus in your heart. Let Jesus in your life. I mean, they're saying it, but they don't tell you, you know, or the public how. It's faith-based and it's not um, described as we're doing it. But all in all, it becomes opening your heart to caring and loving, and then answers will be provided through the spiritual world. And... Um, and we're just living in a time where it's got to be measured, numbered, weight, bought and sold, pensive thinking, structured, analyzed, uh, debated, uh, uh, you know, criticized. And uh, so, so much of the world right now is looking to tear everything apart like a beast and devour it versus that love that of a sheep that just love of just graze. And it's very easy. Yes, and, and to return to the, the idea of the seal. And so when when St. John makes reference to the seven seals of the apocalypse, Rudolf Steiner points to the, that that is the way in which the realm of thought works, is that you, you're like a, a seal pressing into... Sorry about that. We got we got phones going off. Go ahead. Mute that damn. You're like a, you're like a, a a seal pressing. I'm pressing. trying to stop all the stuff. Shut it off. Get behind me. <laughs> you're like a seal pressing into the wax, and the, the wax is the beings of the spiritual world that that stand behind every thought that you have, and you're either directly in relationship to that being, which is rare or you're just using it as a, so to speak, uh, screen on which to project your abstract thoughts, and none of which will remain once you depart this life. And Rudolf Steiner is very clear that people think that, that when they pass away and cross the threshold, well, when I get there, then I'll, I'll find all these things out. You know, it's like, well, it doesn't work like that. If you don't find out while you're down here, you won't figure it out while you're up there. Well, that's the other thing about gratitude, because that's what you're speaking about. Gratitude towards the spiritual world. Acknowledgement with Rudolf Steiner's works, as we look at them, and other um, artists and, and poets and musicians and all the things that they bring, without the acknowledgement 
of the participation of the spiritual world and the in the gratitude we strip ourselves and them of something people would say even the dead that want us real science speaks about this to feel the gratitude for our life gratitude is so important acknowledgement is so important but to acknowledge a blind thing that you learned in your religion that you really don't know how it works how could you appreciate or have gratitude for something unless you're conscious of it and in that it occurred and something was there. I remember I had an ac uh, accident while well, I blow out of my motorcycle and I'm still re resonating from this summer, 65 miles an hour. There's no way I lived. There's no way I should be here. There was definitely powers and I can't prove it to anybody. I don't need to prove it to anybody. I already have proven it to myself that, wow, you were saved, forces and things. And that went right down to the technical, to the tire, to the road, to the traffic, to the people that pulled up behind me. And everyone out there has knows that very few times do we get those near-death experiences to realize, wow, there are powers there, something. Call it God, call it what you will, but the acknowledgement of that action that's what this is about. And it's the same thing with all these things we're speaking about. The acknowledgement that something helped you get that idea, to get that concept, to get that answer. Aha, this is the way. Versus just utilizing it utilitarian. And Steiner speaks also about our machines. And now we should be grateful and have gratitude for the elemental beings that are here bound by Mr. A. Arman to make this and what they're doing and sacrificing in their freedoms for us to have is we have to acknowledge the activity, even if it's a dark force or a, a retrograde force, that it's doing something which we are is helping us live our life. The acknowledgement and the gratitude even to lower beings beneath us. Uh, or higher is so important and not in a flip way where we really don't know what the heck we're acknowledging. That's, that's crazy. That's like dropping acid. No, to really, the more we comprehend the cos uh, cosmology and how this works, the more we can say, aha. And then as we have these events like near death or whatever, the more we compound and strengthen our will forces to say, yes, my will is going to say, yes, this happened. And therefore my next action has more confidence. It has more strength because it's based on these events in my life that were beyond almost act of free will from Nirvana. You spoke about beyond anything that should have happened. They shouldn't have happened this way. They couldn't have without this. And I acknowledge in real time, we're then, in we are then waist deep in the consciousness soul period epic that's where we are when we do that that's what this e epic is about the consciousness soul that part of our soul that's aware aware of truth and reality not aware of just like crazy fiction pretend magic without understanding yes well going back to what i was discussing coming up through the intellectual soul period between 747 BC and 1413, 1414 AD, Ritter Steiner had made reference on occasion to that period as the higher feeling soul. And so you find within that period, these great individuals like St. Francis that were able to really have such exalted levels of feeling that it would sweep them away. Like for example, St. Thomas Aquinas would, he would perform the Eucharist, you know, the communion, and they would have to pull him down because he would start to levitate because he was so wrapped up in the feeling of that so that they were able to develop that feeling level, but they didn't have the conceptual, uh, development that, that was to come later through spiritual science. And when you start to be able to take that and, so to speak, describe things from the other side, from the, the uh, objective uh, reality rather than our subjective experience of the reality. And in one of his basic books, his Collected Works, Volume 9, is uh, Theosophy and Introduction to the Supersensible Knowledge of the World and the Destination of Man. And in chapter three on the three worlds, part three, the spirit land, he says, and I quote, 
it must above all things be emphasized that this world is woven out of the substance of which human thought consists. The word substance too is here used in a far from strict or accurate sense. Thought, however, as it lives in man, is only a shadow picture, a phantom of its true nature, just as the shadow of an object on the wall is related to the real object that throws the shadow. So is the thought that makes its appearance through a human brain related to the being in the spirit land that corresponds to this thought. Now, when his spirit sense is awakened, man really perceives this thought being, just as the eye of the senses perceives a table or a chair. He goes about in a region of thought beings. True, the first look into the spirit land is still more bewildering than the first glimpse into the soul world because the archetypes in their true form are very unlike their sensory reflections. They are, however, just as unlike their shadows, the abstract thoughts. In the spiritual world, all is in perpetual mobile activity in the process of ceaseless, ceaseless creating, a state of rest, a remaining in one place such as we find in the physical world does not exist here because the archetypes are creative beings. And uh, there's a link for that uh, part of the chapter below and also the recorded version well, and you can access the whole book it's a it's a very important book to have under your belt if you're seriously wanting to approach the work of rudolf steiner yeah it's so we we get a semblance, semblance of the matrix here where we can see the matrix is taken it's a materialistic approach to it but this is what uh this is what armin is doing he is uh through the matrix he is creating a materialistic version of he's copying he's replicating what he can only do in the material realm where he exists now after michael threw him out those hosts and lucifer out of the spiritual world they're here mimicking heaven mimicking seeking to mimic in a materialistic approach um when we need to go to the moon sphere consciously as rudolf steiner had done outside a restaurant while he was wide awake and conscious what happens in 1969 we go to the real moon physically so we see that the armin is always looking to take something that's of a spiritual nature and copy it and so not that you don't go to the moon but there's really no reason to go to the lifeless place um as the physical moon and um and so if you if we look at what armin has done and what is what he's doing now he is looking to take everything that we're speaking about and negate it so that it's not real his greatest fear he is that he is the embodiment of fear it is for man to believe in the cosmic christ in the cosmos and the things we're speaking about we can have everything we want in this realm give us the kingdoms of the world as the second temptation of christ but we have to bow down and worship him which means believe in only him as the highest pinnacle not the cosmos and we're in that struggle in that fight every day in our own consciousness the temptations uh, lucifer and armin uh, playing us like a fiddle and finding the equilibrium through christ in the center uh, balancing those two powers uh, to be as objective as we can in the moment and that, i think that's a real point here in the moment in the now everything is happening right now right now and people in especially in theater you have to act in the now in the present moment well the present moment is always changing but the premise present moment is alive you can't hold it you can't catch santa claus in the fireplace or the easter bunny or or the um, rainbow to find the pot of gold you just can't hold it or or the chemical waiting all the things that occur in the room in the castle you can't hold on to it it's fleeting again these are things that would petrify our uh, the times we're living in in academia and uh, what i call the education cartel and dead abstract thoughts that have one meaning which isn't even true and limit the function of that frontal lobe to receive the content because this is important too if we're not bringing in spiritual science and thoughts 
and concepts through the frontal lobe. I want John to take off on this. What is occurring to that frontal lobe development that during the age of Gabriel occurred now during the time of Michael, if spiritual activity is not occur occurring? And Steiner it does mention what happens if we don't utilize spiritual knowledge with the frontal lobe. Yeah, it's, it's a question of, of a, a realized potential. But you have to create an environment that will cultivate one to have the at least the opportunity to pursue that development. And, and that was so much that, that Rudolf Steiner was pointing at within the cultural sphere. You have John Stuart Mill the great genius who passed in 1873 saying, and I quote, persons of genius, it is true, are always likely to be a small minority, but in order to have them, it is necessary to preserve the soil in which they grow. And so it behooves one to, to uh, avail oneself of, of the opportunity to pursue uh, studies along certain lines, uh, and at least expose yourself to great works of art and music and theater, yeah. and that that the more you broaden your range, so to speak, the more capable you are of being able to to guide yourself into a, a relationship with the beings that those artistic expressions are representing, and it's uh, especially within the musical realm. Uh, listening to Yu Yo Wang play uh, the first uh, piano sonata of Franz Liszt, it's, it's superhuman. It's it's and it's something that didn't exist. It came. It was a creation out of nothing. And it's so funny because at the beginning of the uh, I got to get the quotation. It's so funny. At the beginning of the. Uh, when Franz Liszt first wrote it, and mind you, this is a piece that put him on the map, although he was already uh, reaching popularity, yet when he came out with this, it was really too much for some people to be able to relate to. My computer's a little slow here. And, uh, but... Uh, While you're looking for that quote, I'll just wrap up what Steiner speaks about on the frontal lobe. Um, it will become um, atrophied. The ability to think will miss that opportunity to be able to actually think spiritually and the atrophy of the brain will occur and people will then be animal men where they will have uh, instinct, basic instinct drives. And um, so we, we are given this gift to develop spiritually if it's not used it will turn dark and negative so there's no hope for humanity if they do not pick up the arts actually are helpful but also the uh, conscious of soul needs it needs to have the participation of thinking of thoughts and things that are outside the world the rose cross seven roses on a cross things that cannot be found in this realm to be meditated on and to to go into that divakan state, into that nirvana state, um, with the knocking, the hoping, the questioning about spiritual ideas, or let's just call this things from the out of the invisible, because this is one of the things Steiner says I think is so great. Um, three of them, I believe, um, um, where he speaks about um, uh, power um, comes from from the hierarchies we get our strength from the hierarchies and we get our security from come knowing that we come from out of the invisible so if you don't like the word spirit world let's call things from out of the invisible <laughs> remember the invisible man something's coming from out of the invisible which again is a scary thought for for science how, how are you gonna deal with that um and so it's it's so important to realize that the um, the atrophy will occur in the brain. The human being will lose the ability to think, become more uh, instinctive, 
animalistic, instinctive, um, habit forming and unfree. Yes. And, uh, to return to Franz Liszt, his first piano concerto in E flat, when it came out, there's a story. It's, it's funny because uh, Franz Liszt and his son-in-law, Hans von Bülow, uh, wrote the words uh, on the top of, of the uh, piece of music, Das Verstadt er alle nicht, ha ha. None of you understand this, ha ha. <laughs> well, if, yeah. you, if you listen it's, to the, it's the, the humor. Humor played by uh, by uh, Ms. Wang and, and you listen to that opening segment, it's like you wonder how a person could create something with that uh, depth of, of uh, it's just unbelievable, you know, to, and well, just yeah. In the, the first few bars, the co-creation of the angel kingdom, bringing it, bringing it down, and they yes. have the capacity to. It wasn't just the ear; it's not this ear here. People think it isn't this ear that they're hearing with. They didn't hear this. I, I write a lot of music as you do, John. Too, you know, you didn't write that. You just recorded it. Somebody gave it to you. The, we hear it within ourselves, but we're just like the fishermen. We could pull it in the boat. We could put it down on the keyboard and the guitar or on the. Uh, on the composition, musical composition uh, paper, but we pull it in the boat because it came to us, but the egoism would be to believe that we're doing it. Well, yeah, but there, there's that, that tension between identity and identification. Well, it's uh, law. <laughs> a, a, a good example, a good example is uh, in the conversations with Eckermann. Uh, that uh, he was the secretary for Goethe, and Goethe pulled out some sheet music, and he had this sheet music, and he and he showed it to him, and it was all like it had uh, stains from from putting drinks on it, and smudges, and and things crossed out. He says Beethoven, <laughs> and then he pulls up a different one, and it looks perfect. Everything is just absolutely meticulously perfect. He says, Mozart. <laughs> and so the, the process of, of what we're talking about isn't always necessarily uh, so easy to pursue. That there's a, You have to have a willingness to suffer to be an artist yeah. and uh, to be able to, to uh, conjoin wisdom, beauty, and strength is the, the three watchwords of the lodges of St. John. And so you have that, that uh, finding the equilibrium through the expression uh, of the art to be able to take the extremes of, of wisdom and strength and find uh, a harmonization through the realm of beauty. And so it's a wonderful thing. And what a great conversation and, and uh, I'm here and, and uh, I'm the author of The Arcana of the Grail, Angel of Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, as a forward by my buddy, Douglas Gabriel, and uh, many diagrams based on Eric Pfeiffer's cosmological diagrams with great many more added. And then my second volume, I have all those diagrams plus a great many more in the series of Grail diagrams. And that's Arcana of Light on the Path. And that has a forward by William Bento, the noted astrosopher and psychologist. But the, the first volume is currently uh, under reprint and it's hard to carve the time out to get the task done. But the, the, currently, our can of light on the path is available on eBay. Or if you're out of the country, you can contact me by private message on Pace, Facebook or from the link below to my academia page. You can also download a free uh, forward by William Bento uh, and uh, that'll give you a taste of, of what it entails. But uh, I also want to uh, 
find where we are here. That this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of, of Tyla and Douglas and Vadim and Vivian and Jinnah and Neil and Lee and Tom and, and so many other people, uh, James and Marilyn, Ray and Whitney, uh, and, I, and all, all of you that I haven't named, uh, I love you too. And uh, But if you want to buy me a cup of coffee, that's paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And I want to thank you all for coming here and, and sharing uh, your curiosity. And hopefully that it, your curiosity will transform into a, into a more heartfelt striving. And Joe, I want to thank you. And uh, here we go again. We're not done yet. <laughs>